All right, Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 1. Okay, I'm going to uh, recap, we'll read it, we'll pray, and we'll dive in. So we've been talking about how um, in the book of Hebrews, we see that Jesus is totally God and totally man. That is the doctrine of the... Very good. Hypostatic union. That's excellent. All right. We looked at how there's three offices of Christ. There's three offices that Jesus holds. Uh, Somebody just give me one of the offices. King is one of them. Prophet. Priest. Very good. So Jesus is our high priest, and he's our perfect high priest because he's 100% God, he's 100% man. So as God, he's perfect, he's sinless. And then as man, he's able to die in our place. If he wasn't, he wouldn't be able to do that, but he does. So then uh, last week, Cross took us through the end of Hebrews chapter 5, and the author kind of goes on this tangent for a second. He's explaining how Jesus is the high priest, and then he says, I have more to explain to you, but basically you can't hear because you're immature, is basically what he says. And he tells them um, how they can uh, get mature at the end of verse 14 there. He said, solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we are constantly in the word to train ourselves. So this week, we're gonna look a little bit more closely at becoming more spiritually mature. The author kind of continues this thought. So I'm gonna read verses one through eight of chapter six. We'll pray, and then we'll go through and look at them one at a time. So uh, follow along with me if you've got your copy open to Hebrews chapter six. It says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So let's pray. God, we thank you for giving us an opportunity to meet outside. We thank you for keeping the rain away so that we can gather out here and study your word and not be limited by our space and by the social distancing restrictions. Uh, Right now, as we study your word, Father, would you open it to us? Give us understanding and insight. Uh, We want you to teach us and mold us and shape us through your word as we study it. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, so in the first three verses here, So Cross talked last week about, he said that um, in verse 11, that they had become dull of hearing or lazy in their hearing. And it says, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. So now if you look in chapter six, verse one, it says, therefore, what's the question we always ask when we see the word therefore? Wait, somebody said it over here, right? Yeah, what came before it? There's a, there's a catchy phrasing that I use sometimes on it, though. What's the therefore, therefore? That's right. So like Alex pointed out, look before it or ask what's the therefore, therefore. Basically, Jesus is our high priest. This is hard to explain because you're dull of hearing. Therefore, and then that's when it talks about right here in, in verse one, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. So he wants them to move off of the milk onto solid food because he believes that they're ready for it. And he talks about what that milk is. So what is the elementary doctrine of Christ? If you look at verses one, two, and one and two, there's three kind of parts. The first one is laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So that's the first one. The second one is instruction about washings, the laying on of hands. And then the third one is resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So I'm going to look at each of these three real quick. The first one, foundation of repentance and faith. What is this? This is just our salvation. This is what it means for someone to follow Christ. 
if you are looking for an easy way to remember, how do I share someone when I share the gospel? What, what do I say? If you can remember these two words, repentance and faith, that is basically what the gospel is. That's how someone turns to God and is saved. So when we repent, we are turning our new direction towards God from our old life. And when we have faith, we're trusting God to save us and to keep us until the end. Every Christian needs to know this. This is the absolute foundation of everything that we believe is that we can be saved by Jesus if we repent and if we have faith. So how is someone saved? Repentance and faith. That's the first thing that he talks about. The second thing that he talks about, the baptism or the, the cleansing rites and the laying on of hands. If you look in Acts in chapter 17 and in chapter 19, you see they constantly talk about, they share the gospel with someone, they believe, so they lay their hands on them and pray for them, the Holy Spirit falls on them, and then they're baptized. I think that this is what this is referring to here. So this is also important because this symbolizes what happens on the inside of us when we're saved. When we're saved, we are cleansed from our sin, and that's what baptism represents. We are lowered into the water, we have died to our old self, and then we are raised out to walk in new life. We are cleansed from our sin. So in response to that, Christians live through the Holy Spirit as though they're clean even though we still sin. This last one, resurrection and judgment, is still also basic. It's talking about what's gonna happen when we all die. So why do I break this up for you like this? I want you to see in his mind, these elementary doctrine, the um, elementary doctrine of Christ is just your salvation. That's what it is. There's some people who come to God for salvation and then in their spiritual life, that's where it stops. Once I'm saved, I get baptized, I know basic things about the Bible, and I know when I die and I'm raised that I'm going to go to heaven during the judgment. And then that's the end of their spiritual walk. And so what the author is saying is if that's as far as you go, you are immature in your faith. And his desire is for them to grow in that. So in light of that, I want to give you a spiritual word that we're going to unpack a little bit. This word is theology. Can anybody tell me what theology means? Uh, very close. The study of, very, very close. Just a different word instead of Christ. The study of God. That's exactly right. Um, I'm giving you a different phrasing of it here on your listening guide. Someone's theology is their understanding about God. Someone's theology is their understanding about God. So every time you read the Bible, you are studying about God, and in your mind, you're forming thoughts about who God is. That is your own personal theology. So when we study the Bible, everybody who studies the Bible and even everyone who doesn't study the Bible has a theology. They have their idea and their understanding about who God is. So when the author says that he wants us to leave the elementary doctrines of Christ, he's not saying I want you to forget that and do away with it. He's saying I want your theology to be bigger than just you're saved and that's it. I want you to study and to move past that to grow in your understanding of God. So when we study the Bible, we develop a theology and here's why we do that. Next blank on the listening guide. The reason that we study theology is so that we can apply it to our lives. Are y'all feeling that? I know, I was hoping it would slow down, but it's not. We're still gonna hold out. We're still gonna hold out hope. All right. Um, we study theology so that we can apply it to our lives. So I wanna give you, this next one is really big. This summarizes what we just looked at, and this is what we're gonna unpack here in just a second. So get ready to fill in these blanks. There's a few of them here. This is a summary of what we just looked at. Maturing as a Christian means moving past knowing how to be saved and moving towards learning to live wise and godly lives through God's power as we are trained by constant study of his word. So maturing as a Christian means moving past knowing how to be saved and moving towards learning to live wise and godly lives through God's power as we are trained by constant study of his word. And this is God's goal for all of you, for me, for the adults, for you. It's as a believer that you wouldn't just stop after you give your life to Christ and say, okay, life is comfortable now. 
His desire is that you would constantly be trained, like Cross looked at last week, and through that constant training and reading, that you would learn how to apply everything you're reading from Scripture to your life in obedience to Christ. In uh, James 3.13, it says, talking about wisdom that comes from above, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So wisdom is not just about what you know. And the next blank on the listening guide here, to be wise isn't to know the Bible well, but it's to do it well. This is a sign of maturity. So the mature, wise person doesn't just know the Bible, but they apply it. They do it well. Next verses here, verses four through eight, he continues. And this is uh, one of the hardest Uh, verses to interpret in the Bible. A lot of people have a really hard time understanding this. Here's what it says. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. So there's two ways that people understand this. Some people view it that it's teaching that Christians can lose their salvation. It's impossible for those who have tasted and have seen and then turn away to be restored. That's one way. The second way is someone, some people interpret it that whenever someone falls away, it shows that they were never really saved. I believe that that's what it's saying. And I'm going to show you why in just a second. But before I do, next blank on the listening guide here. If you ever reach a hard passage to interpret, Here's what you can do to help you to figure out what it's saying. Use clear verses to interpret unclear verses. So when you're studying the Bible, you come to a passage, you're like, this is really hard for me to understand. I don't understand what this is saying. I know kind of what it's saying. Look for other verses that speak to the similar subject and use clear verses to interpret unclear verses. So I've got a few verses here I want to read to you. One of them we studied um, some time ago. It's in 1 John when we studied that book, 219. And it says that they went out from us, but they weren't of us. And it did it so that it may be clear that they weren't of us. I'm going to go and read it real quick. I didn't write it down word for word there, but I want to look at that. 1 John 219. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Next verse is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. We've studied that recently if you're following on the uh, morning videos. This verse says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And one more is in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So whenever we are saved, we are given a guarantee. That means that it will come about. We will enter into heaven whenever we die. We will not, the Holy Spirit given to us means that we will not fall away. So then how do we use that to interpret our passages that we're looking at in Hebrews? I want you to look at some of the words that he uses. He uses the words that they've tasted. They were enlightened and then they fell away. They say, Jesus is my Lord. And then they come back and say, well, actually, now that I've been with Jesus a little bit, I changed my mind. He's not my Lord. Or they're basically, they're tasting God's goodness and they say, uh, this isn't good. I don't like that. So when it says they've tasted his goodness, they are rejecting that. And in that way, it's like they've crucified him again. So those who leave Christianity aren't Christians who have lost their salvation. Rather, they're people who were never really transformed, which leads us to our next blank here on the listening guide. The transformation of a believer is the best sign of salvation. The transformation of a believer is is the best sign of salvation. And to make the point, the author gives an example here in starting in verse seven. He says, the land that is drunk the rain often, that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. 
But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So in this analogy, there's uh, two, there's two pieces of land. Both of them receive the rain. One of them bears thorns and one of them bears fruit. So we are all that land and the rain that comes down is God's word. And as we hear it, there's two different responses. One response produces thorns. One response produces fruit. But before those are produced, both pieces of land look the exact same. They both receive the same water. The only way to know which field has the fruit in it is to wait and see that fruit being produced. And that's why I think this author is not talking about someone who, oh, well, they were producing great fruit, but then all of a sudden, just all the fruit went away. That's not what he's talking about. Both fields look the same, but they're not the same. One is genuine and one is not. So true Christians, on your listening guide, true Christians are revealed by the fruit they bear as they constantly study God's word. True Christians are revealed by the fruit they bear as they constantly study God's word. So that's what the author is saying here. I'm going to give you three uh, points of application that you can use to apply to yourself. And I want to give us some time to do some reflection. Three things that you can do in order to mature in your faith. Number one, familiarize yourself with the gospel. F-A-M-I-L-I-A-R-I-Z-E. Familiarize yourself with the gospel. One reason that we don't grow in our faith and mature is because we haven't taken the necessary time to lay the right foundation. How many of you uh, love math? Show of hands. Okay, I'm right there with you. Uh, It's very black and white, cut and dry. Two plus two is always four. I don't care what those high up dudes tell you. One plus two is... To, that, that makes no sense, okay? Very easy to understand. However, there are some of you here, I'm pretty sure, that hate math. Let me see who hates math. And the hands all go up. I'm so sorry, you people. It is, it's just so logical. You're just illogical, okay? That's what it is. So in math, one of the things, I got to tutor someone once. This person was in 10th grade, and I'm tutoring her and trying to help her to get her grades up in math. And so we're doing a, an equation and you have to balance the equation. So whatever you do on one side, you got to do it to the other side. And it was something like, it was like 24 divided by six. And so most of us hopefully will be able to say, okay, 24 divided by six. Okay, that's four because four times six is 24. That's a piece of cake. Well, she couldn't tell me this without a calculator. So we got down to it. She didn't know her multiplication tables at all. So like it took a couple of weeks to realize where the problem was because I'm like, okay, she doesn't know how to do fractions. It's okay, we'll go back and look at that. Well, we had a hard time and I traced it all the way back to didn't know multiplication tables. If you don't know your multiplication tables, it's gonna be really hard to like balance a quadratic equation or to do something like that. Like you are gonna have a stinking hard time with that because you need that foundational information in order to move on to something more complex. And it's the same thing in our walk with Christ. We have to familiarize ourselves with the gospel if we want to grow in our understanding of that. It's hard to grow as a Christian if you can't tell someone what it is to be a Christian. So we need to familiarize ourselves with that. There's two groups of people here that often have problems. One group says something like this. I know that Jesus is my Lord, but I really can't tell someone the gospel. If someone says, hey, tell me the gospel, I don't know what to say. That doesn't mean you're not saved. You just can't articulate it. You can't put it into words. There's a second group. This person would say, well, I can tell you what the gospel is. But then if you look at this person, you can't tell that Jesus is their Lord. So they have a mental understanding of the gospel, but they haven't applied that to their lives. They're saying in one sense, I believe Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. But then their life doesn't say I want to live for Jesus at all. It's possible to be a Christian and not be able to explain the gospel, but it's a sign of immaturity. We will not be equipped to live the gospel out if we don't know it. So first thing to do, familiarize yourself with the gospel. If you get to looking and you're like, you know what? I want to do this. Where do I start? 
um, come and talk to me. I'll give you some resources that give you some examples of how you can share the gospel with someone, how you can understand the gospel. But earlier, whenever I mentioned repentance and faith, that is it. Jesus will save anyone from their sin if they repent and turn to him in faith. He will save them from their sin. If you want some more resources on that, come talk to me later. So um, right underneath that, I believe I put it on there, on your listening guide, right under familiarize yourself with the gospel. We won't build on it well if we don't know it well. Did I put that on there? Stink. Okay, write that into the side. Right next to point number one, familiarize yourself with the gospel. We won't build on it well. We won't build on it well if we don't know it well. We won't build on it well if we don't know it well. And that leads us into our second point. That leads us into our second point. How do, how do we get to where we know the gospel well? Number two, deepen your theology. Deepen your theology. Once you know the gospel, you need to grow in your understanding of the Bible. What does the Bible say about abortion? What does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say about the end times? What does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? What does the Bible say about how we can know that there's a God? Uh, what does it say about what church is supposed to look like? What does the Bible say about how to share the gospel with people so they can be saved? What does the Bible say about blank? We need to deepen our understanding of those things. As we study what the Bible says about these things, you're gonna be better prepared to help other people answer those questions and to make godly decisions in your life. If you're not deepening your knowledge of the Bible, your life is basically just gonna be a big spiritual guess and check. What's the godly decision here? Well, I don't know. Let's try this. Maybe you got it right, but maybe you didn't. But the more you study the scriptures, you are going to be equipped to discern between good and evil, like Cross talked about last week. So number one, we need to familiarize ourselves with the gospel. Number two, deepen our theology. Number three, apply your theology. Apply your theology. This is when we take what we're learning and we put it into practice. And when we do this, it's gonna do two things. It's gonna make you more sure that you're saved and it's going to show other people what it looks like to be saved. So on your listening guide, uh, did I put one under that on the listening guide? Oh. Okay, you're gonna write it down. Right next to the third point there, write this statement down. When we apply the Bible to our lives, When we apply the Bible to our lives, we confirm our salvation. When we apply the Bible to our lives, we confirm our salvation and we show the world what it looks like to be saved. When we apply the scriptures or the Bible to our lives, we confirm our salvation and we show the world what it looks like to be saved. When we don't apply, you don't have to write this part down. When we don't apply what we learn from the Bible, our lives send this message to the rest of the world. Being a Christian is nothing more than saying a prayer and living any way you wanna live. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus has died in our place so that we can be saved from our sin. That means you're not enslaved to it anymore. You can turn from your sin and turn to God and he will give you a new life and will, trans and will transform you. So here's what I wanted to do. I really wanted to give you a little bit of time to reflect on this because I believe that there are some of us here that if we were to honestly look at our lives and ask the question, am I bearing fruit right now that makes me confident that I'm a Christian? I think that there's some people here that aren't sure of that. I've had several of you before that have come to me and said, Garrett, I just don't quite know, and here's why. And it almost always boils down 
to the way that you're living almost every single time boils down to that. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like for everyone to take a moment and bow your heads and pray to the Lord. Before you pray, you need to answer a few questions. If you were to look at your life right now, are you bearing fruit that convinces you that you're a Christian? Are you bearing fruit or are you bearing thorns and thistles? Maybe you need to think about how familiar you are with the gospel. If someone were to come to you right now, a close friend, and say, hey, I want to know how to be saved, could you tell them that? In your own words, with your life, here's how you were to be saved. Are you regularly trying to grow a healthy theology by studying the Bible? Do you want to grow in your knowledge of God? Do you want to know God well? Do you see the Bible playing out in your life as you try to obey it? If you don't see any of those things, this is an opportunity for you to go to the Lord and say, God, I want you to change me here. I want you to do this work in my life. I don't think it's just a coincidence that in that passage, it says that this we will do if God permits. If you want to grow in your walk, God is the one who's gonna cause that to happen. So let's take a few minutes, bow your heads and pray. Maybe you need to confess some of these things to the Lord. Maybe you need to spend just a minute asking him to change you right now. Spend just a minute doing that and I'll close this out here in just a minute. Father, we're coming to you right now asking for you to change us and to grow us into mature Christians. Ask, Father, that you wouldn't let us be those who are dull of hearing because we have been lazy in our handling of your word. We pray that you would give us a heart to constantly train in your word, to constantly read and to study and to know it so that it can produce wise living in our lives. Father, would you convict us of those times when we turn away from you, when we know what ought to be done and we turn from that anyway? Father, make us eager to confirm our salvation, to live for you, to show us and give us comfort, God, that we genuinely have been transformed and we genuinely do belong to you. And if there is anyone here that does not genuinely know you or genuinely belong to you, I pray that you would make it clear and evident to them before they turn around and leave, before they turn from you, and say, I'm done, I pray that you would grab them right now, that you would expose this to them so that they can turn back to you instead. Father, we love you. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that you have sent your son to die in our place, though he was perfect, to wipe free our debt that our sin amassed for us so that we can live with you for an eternity free from sin. We thank you for that. And we ask you to do all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Don't get up yet. Here's what I'd like for you to do. On the back of your listening guide, I would like you to write something down. It could be more than one thing. Here's what I want you to write down. Out of the things that we mentioned today, knowing the gospel better, studying the Bible better, or applying the Bible to your life better. Which of those three do you know you need to work on right now? Write that down on the back of your paper. You need to lay a better foundation, know the gospel better. You need to build upon it better and studying the Bible better. 
or do you need to apply what you are learning better? Now, right under that, I want you to make a bulleted list. It can be however long it needs to be. It could be one bullet. Tell yourself how you were going to do that, specifically. And you can't just say, I'm gonna read the Bible more. I want something specific. If yours is, I want to study the Bible better. Maybe one of your bullets could be, I want to write down questions that I have about the Bible. And every week I want to answer one question. I wanna look up the answer to one question and I wanna read the scriptures for myself and come up to an answer with that. It could be, I want to look up four different ways, one way a week of how to share the gospel with someone to better round your understanding of that. It could be, Um, I'm going to contact so-and-so, whoever your best friend is, and get them to point out to me some areas where I could look more like Christ so I can start working on that. Write down something specific. Could be more than one thing. And if you're drawing a blank here and you're like, I don't, I know what I need to work on. I don't know how to go about doing that. You can go to one of your close friends. You can go to one of your Sunday school teachers or one of the adults to help you with that, you can come to me and I'll give you some advice on things that I've done to help myself with that. But don't just leave and not do nothing with this. That's the point of the message today. It's not real deep. It's real easy to understand. It's the spiritual milk. We know what our foundation is. Let's grow in that and let's start to apply it to our lives so that we can mature in our faith. So you take however long you need. We're officially dismissed. By the way, we will have Sunday school inside this coming up Sunday, inside this building. So Sunday school in the building this Sunday. Hopefully we'll see you there. You can show up as early as nine o'clock.